but it's now like a poultry farm. We have too many infrastructures in the name of a politician that you build this during my time, I build this primary center. But they, we don't communicate with the Ministry of Health to know if they are ready to staff it. They don't have the capacity to run all these health centers that we are building. So we spend so much money on infrastructure and we don't allocate money for the services to be rendered in the health centers. So that is a major issue, but that's why advocacy must continue, even with our legislators, to let them know the importance of this spending and the irrelevance of just having infrastructures that we cannot manage. So that's helpful, Senator, and I think in terms of... Just, just, just a minute. Okay. I, I think what is very key, as you have said, Senator, is right now the basic health care provision fund. We really don't have the manpower, the capacity, and the ability to use that money at that primary health care level. I mean at the local level. That would be a major challenge. So well, some I, I have, I have yeah. a question on my power, but I, well, I have a question on my power. Let me keep on this. Let, 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 let me be honorable yeah. minister. Let me be. Let me yeah. look on the finance. <laughs> okay, that's the attitude of a doctor <laughs> in a teaching hospital. We are far removed from where things are, and we think that what we need is a high polluting theatre. All the soldiers in this world to run a primary care center. That is not right. Mm -hmm. In fact, what we are doing is actually building capacity, training them, and they are doing excellent job. That's why we are doing the rollout. Mm -hmm. I think this is a good one. I'll come back to that because the senator had actually touched on the issues about how teaching hospitals are behaving like uh, primary health care. I think we'll come back to that question. Let me keep to the finance one because I think senator made quite clear that it's the issues about efficient use of the resources that we currently have. But going to what um, to Rob now, when you look at all the indices of health finance, whether it's total health expenditure as a proportion of GDP, public health spending as a proportion of GDP, in the Nigerian country, it's been quite consistently low. And from what you are saying, there is a correlation between that and the attainment of UHC. So where do you think we are now if the focus is more around continue where we are or the national health insurance as you understand it that the senator has described? Sure, well, thanks Edgar. And, and I think it is absolutely the case that the, the, the prerequisites for universal health coverage are a genuine political commitment from the head of state and public financing. And um, I will also work for a group called The Elders who are some uh, former world leaders, many of whom have introduced to UHC reforms in their own countries, and they're basically agreed on this. And you might say that the barometer as to whether there is genuine political commitment is the level of public financing, and, and you know, are people putting their money where their mouth is? And um, to, you know, objectively, you have to say that with a 0.47% GDP public health spend in Nigeria, that historically, that hasn't been the case in Nigeria. You know, there, there, there hasn't been that sort of commitment by the head of state. Maybe one or two uh, state governors have um, sort of gone ahead of it and, and put more public financing in. But at that national level, you haven't seen that, that big increase in public financing. The encouraging thing is, though, that you do see right around the world that countries go from that low level to suddenly take off. That, you know, this isn't sort of a slow process that you add on. 0.1.1, and you grew, grew slowly all around the world. Thailand in, in 2001, uh, North, uh, South Korea in 77, Australia 71, as in the UK in 1948. You suddenly see it take off. And that really is where a presidential candidate or, or, or a political party says, enough now. We are going to socialize the health financing system. We are going to uh, introduce a compulsory um, system either through compulsory social health insurance or through general taxation or these days tending to mix the two this is what South Africa is going to do as well and I am confident that at some point in the next 30 years that will happen in Nigeria and you'll be able to name the politician and the year that it happened you know you'll be able to add to that list the, the, now will that be Buhari uh, in 2020 for example you know, we, we don't know. It would be great if he did. Um, if it's not going to be the current president, maybe there are presidential candidates in, uh, you know, further down the line who might be interested in doing this. 
But I think what we in the health sector need to do is to be thinking, how do we pitch this to those leaders that they take that monumental decision to do that? And maybe what we should be doing is selling the political benefits of that, more so than the health and the economic benefits. Because at the end of the day, politicians want power. They want power to be able to stay in, in government and to do lots, lots of things. So if we can package up the benefits of UHS, sure, you know, it's going to improve health indicators and reduce inequalities. It, may, it will lead to improved long-term economic growth. But the best sell to politicians is this is their route to power and to stay in power. And that would be very much my recommendation and engagement with politicians that we go route one and say that UHC brings votes, brings power, and you can become a national hero. And as indicated, Ngozi showed us the indication that the president said health is a human right in Nigeria. So I think that's a good start for a politician. Uh, Professor Hamala, before I bring you, let me open it a bit to audiences around. You can see hands flowing around. Ngozi, do you, do you want to let me? Let's start from the lady there. Oh. You can introduce yourself. I know you, but you can introduce yourself. <laughs> Thanks, to Aliko. Aliko. Um, my name is Tibanjoko. Just um, uh, two key points. First of all, politics is health um, in terms of, and um, even here in the NHS, it is massively political and massively regulated. But I think the question really is how, how in the UK, as an example, the question is not where the money comes, it's what we use the money for. Yeah. Because everybody knows not everything is free in the NHS. I always tell people we do have things we do not fund in the NHS. So it would be good to be clear about what sits in that universal health bucket in Nigeria. Then the second thing I wanted to say in terms of accountability. So one of the things I find myself out doing here under Chatham House Rules, I'll say, is I'm, as managing director somewhere in the UK, I am regularly summoned by local councillors to come and talk through issues. It is a, a, the Health and Overview Scrutiny Committee, those who know about it, and anybody can be called. Secondary care, tertiary care, the ambulance service. That is done in public, with members of the public. So you're taking care closer to the population, they understand what their rights are, they understand what the issues are, and that begins to improve the accountability of, at every level. At the moment, a lot of things are probably done at federal level and secondary level. If you ask local councillors who are closer to the, um, to the public that they serve, do they summon, even private health sector, do they summon them on issues that they're members of their public and we we'll call them town halls? And I would suggest that as a solution in Nigeria because that begins to inform the public so that they begin to understand what their rights are, they begin to understand the information available to them, and then like you said, Rob, then maybe when voting comes, you don't even need to tell them because you can't lie if you've had a town hall meeting yeah. and you have come up with statements and then when it's time to vote. So and then the final point is, it would be good to understand what the minister referred to as the diaspora program because many of us here would definitely want to engage in that. Excellent. Yeah. So, point of reflection because we will take another question. Professor Hamalai, I think the issues of accountability, we need to discuss that. Senator, I think you touched about the legislative network and this idea of scrutiny. Do you have a regular program where you bring people who are responsible for delivering certain responsibility on behalf to be scrutinized? That sort of uh, will be back. Next question. All right, I will, I'll come that way, I promise you. Professor. Uh, good morning. Rotimi. Uh, Rotimi Jai is the name. Um, I think talking about working in silos, what I haven't heard this morning, when you look at education, poverty, uh, literacy, gender equality, is the Sustainable Development Goals. And we do know that the universal healthcare coverage, uh, target 3.8, will drive the SDG. Nigeria did not meet the MDGs, perhaps because we didn't come together like you've all said this morning. What are we doing as politicians, legislators, to talk about the SDG in relation to universal health coverage, or using universal health coverage to drive the SDG goals? Thank you. So again, another question, probably Minister will take this one. It's the beauty of 
what SDG does that is different from MDG, which is the intersectionality, the issues of working as a system. So Minister will want to get some reflection around how this health work with others to look at health as a whole, not just as diseases. I'll take one more question and then we'll there. Shoes, I'll start with him here. <coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Tosin Angela. I'm a clinician, uh, obstetrician and gynecologist. Um, I wanted to make a comment, first of all. I think um, I was speaking to somebody today and I said uh, when I started my training here, about 20 years ago, uh, uh, one of my consultants then told me that the most two wasteful countries in the world are Nigeria and Pakistan. I said, why? He said, because it's unbelievable the manpower that you have and how wasteful you are in one part. So it does, I find it uh, a bit surprising that at primary care level, we cannot right, uh, facilitate those places. As a clinical director in this country, I have consistently been able to recruit Nigerians to MTI, whatever that you know, right? I'm not one of them. Nigerians are actually quite good when it comes to delivery. The problem, is how much it's our problem. Because these are intelligent people sitting now, right? How much is our problem cultural? How much is it us not doing what we want to do? Doctors will go from England, go to states, and go, go to whatever, to show a guy how to do a laparoscopy. In two, three months' time, he'll show you how to do it better in Nigeria. That's the kind of people we are. Thank you very much. So thank you, that's a good comment. And again, it reflects what Ngozi told us about one of the purpose of this session, is to look at the contextual realities in countries. And that reflects culture, social dynamics, economics, and intelligence. Because there's no doubt about human capital in Nigeria and the intelligence potential. You just need to look everywhere in the world to see that. Why is that not being harnessed and optimized for the country? So I'll come back to one round of questions, I promise. But well, let's start with the accountability question then. Uh, Professor Hamalai, do we have a system of accountability where people feel that the politicians are doing what they promised to do? And what are the consequences for inaction? Uh, thank you so much for that question. Um, I've read some research reports that actually conclude that politicians are over accountable. They are too accountable. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is a serious research. Let's have a finish up for This is a research <laughs> report presented at Rockstone College um, in, in Oxford here. So, and I could see it. What, what, what do you mean by too much accountability? Every politician has to go back home, has to give money, has to build clinics, boreholes, give generators out, and health issues. You cannot imagine how much each politician has been given to his constituents from his pocket to pay medical bills. It's, it's, it's huge, personal resources. So as for accountability, I think our politicians are just too accountable. The weight is so much on them that I believe that we need something. We need to reform the system in such a way that politicians will have more time to do their work, legislative work and other work, rather than handling personal demands from constituencies. So I think uh, this is important. And there is no politician that is not interested in health. There is no politician that is not interested in funding health. But if you look at some of our countries, look at the poverty rates in our countries. If you look at Nigeria, for example, from 2015, in Baku's insecurity, the very few health centers we have are being destroyed by Boko Haram. The whole of the Northeast is in a, is in a huge mess, health-wise. 
because of this security situation. You are, the, the economy has been in recession, out of recession, but it's still not stable. So why are you going to get even some of the resources that we are talking about? So it's, 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 it's not as if the resources are there and you refuse to just allocate 15%. No, I think it's beyond that. So we have to focus on repairing our economies, providing security, creating a stable environment for development to occur. And that's how I think colleagues probably around the table will come up with some comment at a point around how Uber accountable politicians are. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come, we'll come, we'll come to that. I'm sure that will be some comment. Let me pick on this other issue that, because I think the legislative network, my understanding of it, is one of the innovative way of engaging legislators with health that has been pioneered in Nigeria. And, um, Dr. Banjiko asked this question around, do we have a system whereby you hold people accountable from your health committee, where if you feel a teaching hospital or a ministry or something, you can summon them in to sort of be accountable for the actions of which they are intended to deliver? What, what sort of mechanisms do we have for that, both at federal and at your state level of legislative networks? One, one of our cardinal responsibilities is that of doing oversight of all these institutions. We have to print money to them, and we expect to go back there and see what they have done with the money. But um, unfortunately, the local council in the UK, they are so confident to summon different institutions to come and account for whatever petition that is written to them, because they have funded them. Because they know that they, are, they should not be in a position not to deliver. But unfortunately for us, in the last few years now, or months, because we have not really funded this institution, we have already appropriated money in the budget, but they haven't received the money. So when we go there, they will now be questioning us that, what do, they want, what, do you, what do we want them to do? And we have not paid for them. Maybe someone wrote a petition that you got there, there was no water. Meanwhile, in the budget, we have already put that money for them to have a bubble, but they haven't received the money. So we know the answers now, and we believe that the next uh, four years should be better if all what we have done now, if we implement them, yeah. that they actually get funded, and they have no reason to give excuses for failure. But so now we are in that transition period that we, we too we are just trying to build them, yeah. make them confident to deliver to the public. In addition, I think, to the resources issues, it seems what is coming around in terms of confidence is also the level of awareness and understanding of the right questions to perhaps ask. I think I remember you mentioning this is something that you want to sort of, um, if you like, scale across all legislative networks so that people are confident enough to know they can ask the right questions about health, about universal health coverage, about whatever is needed. Is that still the intention or has that changed? Well, I mean, the legislative network is to enable the legislators yeah. to really know the general problems of the country. Okay, for example, the, the legislator in uh, the Kano state, for example, they will think, oh, maybe the first thing they should do is to build a primary health center or something like that. But we are saying, okay, let us even concentrate just on water for everybody. Exactly. Let's, this year, let all of us make sure all our health centers, they have water. Let us add the appropriate on water this year. Okay? That communication amongst us we will be able to change the way we do our budgeting. Okay. So I believe the legislative network is the key for progress for the legislators in terms of their appropriate. I hope we hope it's your new replacement, then hopefully the new Senate chair that will be coming since you said you are taking a break will be quite a good colleagues to engage with and we can certainly see what we can all do collectively to improve that awareness and understanding among legislators. Minister Intersectorality, I think yeah. Professor Rotimi asked about what have we done to break down this barrier of health is just about disease and provision of services. 
norms? I, I, I think the beauty of the basic air pollution fund, which you call UWE, uh, UWE is an Ibira award uh, for life. We did some crowdsourcing and we chose UWE. Uh, it's beyond, it's because we're going beyond the concept of diseases. We are looking at prevention. And then we're also partnering with line ministries of water, environment, education, because these are quite critical. Uh, even women affairs, uh, in order to address some critical challenges that we're facing. The, the real beauty of the SDG agenda is the network beyond health, looking at prevention and how dental education, poverty education, addressing hunger. Uh, will improve the status of every country. So I, I think we're quite really on spot with this. But let me just steal the opportunity to address two quick questions. One, on the minimum package of care. Uh, we do not, what we have for now is not enough to take care of all that we would love to take care of. So we, the Act empowers the Minister to determine what the minimum package of care will be. And for the basis of the NPR basic care provision fund, we're taking maternity care, including payment for cesarean section. We're taking under five ailments, including immunization. We're taking um, family plan as part of it. We're looking at under, uh, looking at malaria, which is our number one challenge, uh, and we're also looking at screening for hypertension and diabetes. So we're starting with this. And then we will then handle acute management and also give education, knowledge and training to mothers about breastfeeding and how to prevent malnutrition. So for now, this 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 and let me also quickly turn left. Um, the basic care provision fund is not too new. We started what we call an energy project, the Nigerian State Investment Project in three states of Adamawa, Nasarawa, and Ondo states. With one bank money, we added five additional states. And what did we do? We wanted to demonstrate that what is critically important at PAC level is giving them money. And fortunately, the director of plan is there, Dr. Mary Bule, the power site is there, they will bear testimony. This is a pilot project where we operated three financing models. One we call the direct financing facility. We give money to the PC every month. The second one is called the performance-based finance. We give you a basic. When you do well, we give you a top-up. And the third one, we call it business as usual. And when we went around to look at the performance of the, both the PBF and the DFF, we are quite comparable in terms of outcome. But the business as usual, you visit a primary care center, there will be no chair, no bed, there are no drugs because there was no funding to them. And that's how we grew this system. So if that worked, let, let us now give them money directly. And giving them money directly will ensure that they can improve, they can buy bulbs, they can make sure the taps are running, and then they can buy commodities and give incentives to the staff. So three things. 15% of the money is for infrastructure, 20% for commodities, and 10% for human resources. And we have the manual, one document document that we spent one year developing, which is also available on the website okay. of the ministry. Thank so you. it's important for the policy to Thank look you. at this and then advise on Absolutely. Right. I think I'll, because of running time, there are two key questions I think I will need to raise and uh, come back to you because I think you touch on that, Minister. Every health system relies solely, the number one thing is about it, the workforce, the health workforce. And Nigeria, by all level of evidence we know, is suffering from chronic shortages of healthcare workers, doctors, nurses, and so But we recently had one of your colleagues, I think, on the news. Actually, you have a surplus. Is that a government view, or is that a personal view? <laughs> Seeing Nigeria in the system, 
where everything now is being has left at the mercy of federal. Nothing is happening at the state level. And that has greatest significance for you. If you ask me, my greatest frustration as a minister is because the states do not see health as important. Mm -hmm. Same for education. When the people tell you there are 13.5 million school children out of school, they are not federal students. Mm -hmm. They are states. Primary education is the responsibility of states. The states should put them in primary schools. Same for primary care. It's not their responsibility. But if we fail to tackle it, they will rush to the teacher hospitals and medical. That's why we are it. It's not, not at the range, but we're taking it on. The problem with human resources is that about 70% of our doctors, let me just use doctors, are concentrated in Abuja and Lagos. That's all. And then they are all in the federal institutions. About 80 to 85% of our budget is personal. And, and, and let me go for that. I will use, use usage and not as an example, and use Alpha and Adama one. In usage alone, there are 325 consultants. At the state level, there are only 25. Because the states will not pay them. The consultant in Atadeo or your, or, or your state has a little more than the house officer usage. So nobody wants to go there. And you say, you tell you, if you ask me, I'll say, you say, we're overstaffed. We don't need more doctors. We have enough. In fact, what we need to do is make them do more work. In my department of Bob and Guide, I will use that as an example, 22 consultants. We deliver 2,000 women a year. So, Minister, so, can I? Let me just finish. <laughs> you get to Adam and Zamfara State, there are 122 doctors in the Federal Medical Center. When you visit the state, there were 22 doctors covering 24 hospitals in Zamfara State. In Adamawa, I stopped in Jida, and I would enter into the general hospital. Only one doctor. And yet, the FMC ULA, owned by federal government, over 200. Yeah. So, it's the problem of the state. So, if you, at a federal level, you, you say, oh, we are overstaffed, and people might misinterpret it. It's the typical story of the Obama saying the Calabash is, is heavier than the, the porcelain pot. But what he should have said is that the dry Calabash or the wet Calabash is heavier, and that's correct. But the dry Calabash is lighter. So at federal level, we are overstaffed. Too many people. But at state, nobody. And I think many, uh, the people, many people recognize that Nigeria is a federal republic. You have the federal, state, and, and that. But but exclusive class. Yeah, but well, remuneration, remuneration and retention is an important element of every healthcare system. Particularly, we talked about quality here. Is there no drive for a harmonized salary structure? Yeah. And I must refer to a question here where someone said, ask them, why are there are big differentials be between legislative income and doctor's income or nurse's income in the country. Perhaps, Senator, you might say something. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, fortunately, there are three senators here. <laughs> and the honorable member of the House of Rep. Uh, we do not know how much they are. <laughs> so uh, I, I think he is most competent to handle that. <laughs> But I'll tell you that if you ask me today, I'll tell you our healthcare professionals are on the page. Mm -hmm. We need to give them a sense of that. The drive for the harmonized in, in India, you are not only well paid, you are sponsored to attend two overseas conferences a week yeah. and four conferences within the country. And that's why when you go to international meetings, you find India, mm -hmm. they are supported. You are given free accommodation. Mm -hmm. So we need to build incentives. So, so let's so maybe, over, maybe over to we pick up the same percentage. Yeah, maybe we pick about how do we address these underpaid issues then for the healthcare workers and ensure that we are retaining them and keeping them where they should be to improve the quality of health. Well, in the country. Uh, I believe it's, it's very simple. Uh, in the government of Nigeria is separated into three arms. We have the executive, we have the judiciary, and we have the legislature. The legislature determines the salaries of its own people. The executive determines theirs. The doctors and nurses are under the executives. <laughs> <laughs> they, 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 determine, they determine what they are going to pay them. 
Depuis des temps, ça, il y a un sous-bénéfice de MC, de fait. Ok, but uh, now, just to give you an example of that, Delta State Governor, the former governor, yeah. Dr. Oduan, he came to the United States to shop for doctors from Delta State. And he told them that, look, whatever your salary in, in America, I will pay you in Asaba, in Delta. And he got so many doctors to come back home. And he was paying them, I don't know how he did it, but I'm not trying to tell you it's an integrity position. So we just need to take health, uh, isolate health, yeah. and don't put it in the structure, salary structure of the country. Okay. Otherwise, the UK, I mean, I want to propose to you that what you're having here today, you should call the British to come and let's talk to them to help us stop taking all our doctors. <laughs> okay, or, or maybe they just send them two months. Back to Nigeria. I think there is a question about the diaspora thing, but I think I would quickly want to take questions here because of time. So I will start with you and then go backwards. Call it here in the front, then. Thank you, very so. Thank you very much. My name is Mohammed. I work for the government of Kaduna State. I'd like to. Commissioner for Budget and Planning. Mr. Minister, I want to disagree with you a little bit. <laughs> you said that the states don't really care about um, health care. I think that there are exceptions, um, and I think that there is general concern, even from the political leadership at the top. What we face in Nigeria today, both at the federal and the state level, is we have a challenge of fiscal space for health and other development activities. Um, this is actually quite serious. The federal government is lucky. I mean, it's the federal government. You collect the money, you take 54% of it, and we share 24% across 36 states, and then the local government takes the rest. Beyond the resources that you have, you can also print money, you can also borrow. <laughs> so, so there's a big difference with the fiscal space that's available for state governments. Beyond that, Honorable Minister, we also have primary health care centers. The responsibility constitutionally for health care at that level, there's local governments and state governments by some extent. So when you come out to the issue that Professor Galani chiefly raised earlier regarding, for example, human resources for health, these are huge amounts of money, huge, uh, when you talk about staffing every single primary health care center with medical personnel, uh, when you talk about equipping them and infrastructure. There, there's actually a huge um, issues that we have around that. And so it's, we frequently divorce the discussion around health with the general and larger economy. And I think Professor Hamala had started to talk about some of that, about the reason why we cannot just take the health, because when you're elected as an executive, you are dealing with an entire package of issues. So sustainable development itself, if you look at the first five or six goals of it, looks at the unfinished work of the MDGs. But the other half of it looks at how to find out, how to govern, how to ensure that this sustainable development is then sustainable. So I think that we cannot treat health completely isolated because we, can, we also have education issues. We have security issues, we have job issues. So I think that taking that package as a whole and understanding that as a state government what you have is how you can parcel it out to these various sectors. If we keep on having an isolated discussion on health, I don't think that we can ever really achieve that entire full package and have that vision to be able to do that. So we really need to crowd in these discussions. The last thing I want to mention is around political incentives. It's very politically on, um, it, it, it's not, you don't encourage politicians to invest in health or education because they can't see it, right? Nobody sees it, nobody gets elected for providing universal health coverage. <laughs> they get elected for, for providing healthcare infrastructure. So I think we need to talk about that. <laughs> I think let's quickly get to comment because I think if Governor yeah. accepts that fact, quick one, yeah, that, and I pleaded with him to become an ambassador and talk to his colleagues, and he has accepted. He, you see, I did mention Cardinal State. Your governor is one that has things on his fingertip. And I've asked the Oshun governor to follow. But health, at the state level, but that are the few states, nothing that. I think one, one of the key issues that we haven't been able to have time is the domestic resource mobilization mm -hmm. agenda that we haven't touched. Quick comments, please. We need to finish soon. One, 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 then Rob. 
and then we'll try and round up. We need to get out of here for 11, please. Okay, my name is uh, Fatima Abba, and really just my comment, which is also probably going to be a question in this context, is we're talking about the different challenges, which is around delivery of healthcare at maybe state levels and then down to local levels, and these are the challenges. And then um, the Senator also mentioned about the fact that um, when well, we don't implement and then we get states not ha um, signing up to things. Do we then think that maybe for healthcare, Nigeria will benefit from a decentralized system where the federal will manage some of the uh, projects for direct delivery of healthcare and then the local levels can be then re um, responsible for implementing. That way you cut out some of the bureaucracies, you cut out the num numbers of people or teams or groups accountable that you have to hold accountable. It will then tie in with some of the um, uh, town hall things that we're talking about where you have a small number of people accountable rather than different tiers of government. Do we think Nigeria will benefit from that? All right. Thank you very much. We'll take that comments. Two comments quickly. The colleague and the lady. Thank you very and much. And then I'll come back. So my name is Chukudi Anadam. So I'm just going to hit on two certain points. One is the workforce in terms of some things. So we said we're going to work, focus more on solutions rather than the problem. So one of the things I want to ask about, are we looking in the direction of trying to create incentive for people to actually want to work in the local government? So for example, I graduate as a doctor and the next thing I want to do is work in a teaching hospital. But for example, in the UK, I can work somewhere and start working my way up in the sense that when they want to actually take you in the teaching hospital, they're actually looking at what you have done down. So if I work in a primary health care center, do they factor that in when they're trying to take me as a resident, rather than the fact that they only factor in economic, um, what I know at that point? So those are questions we need to ask ourselves, because if you don't push that growth, that people start seeing it, for example, before you are appointed as a consultant in a teaching hospital, do they actually see your input in the local level? What have you done to earn you that seat on the hierarchy? So in that case, that would take me to the point where we start talking about regional centers of excellence, in the sense that, for example, University of Ibadan today, we know it's an excellence for oncology. So for example, what are you trying to do in terms of trying to make sure that in each region, we have one center of excellence where everybody aspires to go there. So I am incentivized to actually work in all your state federal medical center because I know that I want to get to this regional center of excellence. But down here, this is something that's going to make me actually, irrespective of the fact that they might not have the good resources to keep me there, but because I know it is a pathway for me to climb, mm -hmm. I will actually want to work there. So the next thing I want to talk about is in terms well, of research. Well, okay. Sorry, just <laughs> I just want to hit on that because in terms of research and understanding, for example, the senator has talked about how they come up with a plan on funding and everything. But the question is, like for example, high school in Sheffield, and one thing I noticed is the nice you understand the healthcare system, the government goes to the university to ask questions before they come up with the policy. So you find out that when you are even in the university, there are questions on the table who they are saying, who we want students to volunteer to answer these questions. So are we doing that? Are we trying to bring these questions that you have? Like the Minister of Health is saying, you have a lot of questions in the Ministry of Health. What are you doing to put these questions out there for those of us who are out there, who are willing to answer these questions, who are ready to do the work to pick up on these things? And how are you going to support that? So those are basic questions I want to ask. Thank you very much. Excellent. There are two good questions, but there are also solution-focused questions. Why the right ones were looking for? The lady. Uh, Thank you very much. My name is Onyinye. I'm from the University of Cambridge, and I have a communications background in health and governance. And I just want to touch quickly on financing. Um, Rob mentioned that it's very important that we have financing in healthcare and. Amongst the work that I've done, I've seen that one of the reasons people do not seek health care is because they can't fund it. The senator definitely mentioned the idea of having everyone give, you know, one dollar every month. And I think it's a really good idea. I mean, one dollar can be easy for some people and not for some other people. But then I think my question here is, has the legislature also thought about how to get that money out of people? Because people are very disenfranchised now about how to give. And then also because we do not really have a very clear system of tracking how things are done in Nigeria. You know, so my question is, I think it's a good idea. How do you get people to then give the money? Thank you. I will address that question. Dorcas, one question from my colleague over there. Thank you, Dorcas Brotter from Zimbabwe, um, Pet Advisor. 
I just wanted to um, what Nigeria's appetite, real appetite, to learning from other countries is. And that is anchored to Madame's point on research and evidence. We haven't got many things wrong in Zimbabwe. We got quite, quite a lot of things wrong. But one thing we did get right was the Friendship Bench Project, which is a project anchored on the use of community healthcare workers. Now, every work, everyone who works in a healthcare system, including the cleaner who cleans the hospital, is a stakeholder to the system. In Africa, as gen, in general, we probably have, Prof, you know, only three health uh, ministers, ministers of health in the continent, are not doctors. One of them is from Botswana, which has reached milestones in terms of achievement. I just wanted we could open up that space to think about what does Nigeria mean to the rest of Africa and what does the um, rest of Africa mean to That's anchored to culture, and I think that's very important. I just wanted to back in with just one last question. We in Africa and who are non -Af -Af Nigerians look to Nigeria for leadership on many things in the continent. And there are some populations that are not necessarily falling within um, universal health care. We're looking for leadership and someone to take on the issues of xenophobia in South Africa. Xenophobia is a fact, it's a new phenomenon. There are no new policies around this, it's a new phenomenon. In a democracy that's trying to make sense of its own population. Can we really look to Nigeria, not necessarily to lead, but maybe to provide some guidance so that the continent is not disturbed? We cannot continue to firefight an, an, an issue which is affecting the entire, entire co co continent. Thank you very much. Range of questions here, and we don't have a lot of time, so I will just try and dedicate this for five minutes. Well, I will give you one chance. You've been persistent with your hands, so just one minute for a question. Then the gentleman over here. Then what I will do is to extend some of the comments from colleagues, and then I will ask one final question. Thanks very much indeed. I'm Ibrahim Bolaji. I'm a consultant obstetrician and gynecologist. I'm also the president of Medical Association of Nigerians across Great Britain. The reason why I'm persistent is because I think there are lots of healthcare workers, professionals in the room, and I want to take that opportunity. The Honorable Minister, at the inception of his position, started off 111, and I think he alerted to that very briefly. And the diaspora office also introduced Pride and Prime. I think my colleague here was partly responsible for some of those. But about four years ago, the two programs have been Put together. I'm not sure whether you are aware of what those programs are. This is about skills transfer from the healthcare professionals in diaspora to Nigeria. So these two programs have now been merged together and they are now called DPHI, Diaspora Private Health Initiative, no, Professional Health Initiative. And the components of this includes MONSA, which is Medical Association of Nigeria Across Britain, the National Union of Nurses, and the President is here with me and a large number of other organizations across the globe. We have CAMPAD, which is Canadian Association of Physicians in, in Canada, and we have a group in America, also in Germany and South Africa. So these groups have now come together. I think the Federal Minister of Health has introduced the DPHI, and three items have been sent forward to be considered. That's in oncology, renal services, and cardiology. So just watch this space. There's a lot of opportunity for you, healthcare professionals in the UK, to make a contribution to our motherland. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will quickly get comments from there. Rob, there was discussion from our colleague from Kaduna State about resource mobilization, and so you wanted to comment about efficiencies of resources and perhaps well, if, if everything is said, uh, it was really the point, and th thanks for setting me up for this. You, you're, you're suggesting that UHC doesn't win elections. I'd, I'd like to, uh, to differ with you on that, that right across the world, UHC is winning elections time and time again. And I think, to be honest, I think Nigerian politicians are missing a trick on this. If, if you look in uh, Australia, they're having elections soon. The Labour Party is challenging on a UHC platform to reignite their health reforms. In the United States, it's very likely that in 2020, you're going to have a progressive Democrat taking on Trump. And the number one domestic issue is health access. And um, you look at the Labour Party here in the UK, they managed to oust Winston Churchill at the end of the Second World War when he was a world hero on a platform of universal health coverage. And the thing is, it's, it is very visible, and, and you, know, you can get very quick results by removing user fees, providing access to free medicines, making sure the health workers are paid. 
it's, it's relatively simple to do quite quickly, and, and politicians are learning this right across the world. And what you're seeing in, in some big countries that haven't achieved it yet, that are often of a federal nature, that state governors are getting ahead by bringing UHC to their provinces. I'll give you the example of Jakarta in Indonesia, where the governor um, came to power with a massive agenda, wanted to do lots of things. He realized that UHC reforms were going to be the things that he could do quickly. And within two years, he'd introduced it. He ran for president. He won the presidential election. And he's just in the process of being re-elected again, largely on his health reform. So my top tip to any aspiring, say, governor in Nigeria who wants to be president, run on a UHC platform. Thank you, Rob. I think we promised, that's good, there are a number of questions that have been raised here, which to me are going to generate a lot more discussion. I like the human resource discussion that a colleague raised there around pipeline of uh, becoming a specialist, there are a number of issues about quality of care that we have not been able to address. There's a bit of issues we wanted to pick on around medical detention, Honorable Minister, which we've not been able to address <laughs> adequately, but we hope we might be able to get some time, another time to do that. We have to quickly now, I will ask a quick question, and then we get Ngozi a bit of time to just sort of discuss the Nigeria Health Initiative I was talking about. But starting from Rob, knowing what we have heard so far, I've been quite a close friend with Nigeria for quite some time. If we're looking the next four years to have two priorities, what would that be? And I'll go around the table to ask that. What would should be the two key priorities for the next four years in terms of UAC and health? Very quickly, that, that I think that President Bahari still has time to be Nigeria's UHC hero. There will be someone who will do this. And you're seeing President Kenyatta doing this in Kenya in his second term. Don't forget President Obama brought to the Obamacare reforms in 2012. That would be the top priority, to ensure him that he could be the UHC hero. If he decides he doesn't want to do it, let's find the UHC hero of the future and support them. So political commitment from the highest level. Professor Hamalai, what would you think would be the main priority based on all the discussion we have? One or two would be just mentioned them for me, that would be enough. I think key is the absorptive capacity of states. Um, states probably cover more than 50% of, even 80% of Nigerians in terms of primary health care. And if you don't improve on their absorptive capacity for the 1%, 2% whatever it is consolidated government funds uh, allocated to basic health care. Uh, then we will continue to have the same problem uh, round and round and round. Then the, 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 yeah, the second, the second is the doctors. They need to stop going on industrial strikes every now and then. Okay. <laughs> The outgoing chair of our Senate Committee for Health, what would you leave us a sort of focus for the next four years, please? What would you think should be? Uh, for the immediate future, say so over the next six months to one year, yeah. uh, to increase the confidence of Nigerians in the primary health centers, that is to now appropriate the physical health care provision fund to develop our primary health centers, so that the people will now be encouraged to pay because they, 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 they are not agreeing to pay because they believe we don't have anything to offer them. So that should be the first priority I would suggest. And the second one is now to encourage, to do a lot of advocacy in the states, our governments, to let them know that it is only a healthy citizen that goes to school for education. Yeah. Only a healthy citizen that will go to the farm for farming. Healthy citizen that will go for security issues in Madhubi. So they should not be comparing health to all these institutions. Because if they are not healthy, they cannot do all the things. So health should be isolated and it should be funded. So I'm hearing states coming around also as, as Dr. Uh, Professor Hamala is a chief officer of health in Nigeria. What do you think we should be our first key priorities to build on what you've been doing? Well, uh, I, I think what is important, in addition to all that has been said, in sustained political commitment and action uh, on the part of Mr. President. Uh, I, I think we are not short of political will, but we need commitment and action. 
And I will see two things happening. One, accelerated reduction of matter than on the five percent in Nigeria, and the drastic reduction of out of pocket expenses. So that you don't have to pay for your pocket, which literally will translate to UEC. Thank you, Mr. And Professor Galarenchi. Yeah, I think um, we need strategic planning based on evidence uh, if we really want to achieve universal health coverage. And I think there should be an effective monitoring and evaluation. People should be held accountable and having good governance. And then finally, systematic reporting, which means we get reports so that we can do better. And I think bridging the gap between academia and policymakers is key in achieving these three uh, processes. So informed evidence, policy, and measurable actions to set a system. Fantastic. Thank you very much, everyone. Before we all go up, I think we will we'll promise to have a wrap-up. And Ngozi is here to just help us wrap up key issues and perhaps introduce you to your concept we're thinking about, and then we can do the final side. Thank you, Professor Ligo. Um, thank you so much, panel. That was fascinating, and I just love Nigeria. It's so passionate. You know? <laughs> the only the only time you can come to like a seminar and be like leave excited is when you're with Nigerians. So thank you so much. Um, so I wanted to tell you about our Nigeria Health Policy Initiative. Do you see that on the screen? Is it that? No. I'm not sure if it'll, it'll go there, so I'll just explain it. So, us at the forum, we really want to, actually, you spoke a lot about it, yes? Do you see it now? Yes? yes. Okay. So, um, this gentleman in the front, I'm sorry, I don't remember your name, but you spoke about, you know, engaging the diaspora, engaging health workers from the different um, countries. Nigerians are everywhere. There's a Norwegian MP that is Nigerian. <laughs>